Okay. Okay, so let me introduce Kevin. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank Kevin for accepting this invitation. Um, Kevin is a professor in the Imperial College in London, specializing in algebraic number theory. And I would like to also to thank Leonardo Moro, to um, my friend that introduced me to Kevin. And Leonardo is the main author of the, the, the author of the, the internal improver. So for the past three years, uh, Kevin has been involved in, in math community around the theory improver called Lean. And he started the, the Gena project, the use of theory improvers in mechanization of mathematics and uh, mathematical groups. And for sure, I think we will learn a lot from, from, from him today, talking about this part. Uh, I, but I must highlight how much Kevin has contributed to the Lean community with uh, all initiatives like the natural number game that I'm using my course in, in mathematics now, and several videos in YouTube, answering questions in Zulip chat, uh, amazing books like the Mathematics in Lean, uh, interviews to, to, to spread the word about Lean. Um, and that's all fantastic. And so I think it's a pleasure to have uh, Kevin with us today. And I really hope that this these lecture promote Lean uh, in Brazil make you popular comments for us. Thank you, Kevin. Nice well, to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and so we uh, we met online, Alexandra and I, we met on a, on a, in a lean chat room, basically. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about some software called lean. But before, I mean, let me give you an overview of what I'm going to say. So here's the plan. So firstly, I'm just gonna briefly observe that computers have changed mathematics. Uh, and, and then I'm gonna remark that actually, I know many people for whom computers have not changed mathematics. Uh, and then we're gonna see, I'm gonna you know, play a computer game. I'm gonna show you a piece of software and then we're going to ask, you know, will computers change mathematics? So it's all about, you know, it's, it's all about, the, you know, what's happened, you know, the relationship between mathematicians and computers, right? You know, many of us don't know any programming languages. Uh, we might use computer algebra packages, but, uh, but I wonder, you know, I wonder what the future will hold. So, of, of course, Computers have changed mathematics. Uh, they've, you know, they've they've changed it a huge amount uh, because, I mean, the dumbest way is the way that you know computers have changed everything. The internet has changed everything. Uh, so nowadays, you know, mathematicians, mathematicians talk, you know, talk through email, and uh, you know, we have these resources like the archive is where I upload my papers, and Wikipedia, where I, you know, where I look for. Facts and you know, if I don't know something uh, in a neighboring area, I, there's often a Wikipedia page where I can, you know, learn a lot very quickly. Uh, but that's not what this talk is about, of course. You know, computers do you know number crunching, right? They can run simulations, uh, so we can look at you know we can look at solutions to differential equations. I I live in London and I work at Imperial College and. Next door to Imperial College is the London Science Museum. And in that they have a very primitive machine that can solve fourth order differential equations. Uh, you set the dials to the coefficients, then mechanically it approximates, it approximates the solutions. But computers, you know, com computers have completely changed everything. Uh, now we can do huge numbers of simulations and uh, experiment with all kinds of initial conditions. Uh, but in pure mathematics, we, I'm a pure mathematician, we, we found that uh, it's very powerful. Uh, we can test conjectures. We can loop through the prime numbers. If we have some conjecture about prime numbers, for example, every even number, which is four or more, is supposed to be the sum of two prime numbers. Uh, and you know, people used to check this thing on paper, like four is two add two, six is three add three. The Goldback conjecture, eight is three out of five. It, these even numbers are the sums of two prime numbers. But should we take this conjecture seriously? Well, we should because you know we can we can test it for all we can test it for all numbers less than ten to the twenty. Uh, 
So computers have changed pure mathematics, uh, you know, but maybe not as much as they could have done. So they've revolutionized applied mathematics, but, but what about pure mathematics? So let me give you one example of where the computers really did, computers, computers showed us an extremely important thing. And this is a very early example of uh, computers, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. So Birch and Swinnerton Dyer are two British number theorists. And, uh, and in, the 19, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, we, had just, we were just beginning to understand that we, we understood completely degree two equations in two variables, but there was a lot of theoretical work going on about degree three equations in two variables. So the idea is you want to say something about the integer solutions or the rational solutions. And these turn out to be very delicate problems. And uh, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is one of the most famous conjectures about cubic equations like this. And uh, it's a, an extremely deep conjecture, it seems, of relating the number of solutions to this equation. I mean, this is a cubic equation in two variables. This is in some sense a very simple object. But you can ask two questions about it. You can ask how many solutions are there modulo some prime number. Uh, and you could also ask how many rational solutions there are. And what Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer did was that, that they realized there was a very, very subtle link between these two questions. And they discovered this link. What they needed was data. And so they uh, used this very, very early, this gigantic computer that, you know, the size of a, the size of a house basically, uh, this computer that was built in Cambridge, UK in the, in the late 1950s. Uh, and they just, they took several examples of these equations and they worked out all the solutions, modulo two, modulo three, modulo five, modulo all the primes less than a hundred. Uh, and, they, and they computed these numbers and they drew graphs and they compared it with the number of solutions in the rationals. And they came up with some first version of a conjecture relating these, uh, these two, uh, these two quantities. And uh, then, they, uh, then, you know, they were theorists as well. They took, you know, they started thinking theoretically and came up with a very nice way of expressing their conjecture that's still open today. And in fact, if you solve their conjecture, you get a million dollars. It's one of the clay millennium problems, the Birch and Sinner's entire conjecture. But the origins of that conjecture uh, came from a computer. So this computer had I, I looked it up, it had uh, 6,000 bits of memory. And uh, it's new breakthrough, the, the reason EDSAC2 was much better than EDSAC1 was EDSAC1 only had 4,000 bits of memory, but EDSAC2 could also operate on all the digits of a number simultaneously. So it could, it could do calculations, not just with bits, it could do calculations with, uh, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with binary numbers. So this was their breakthrough. Uh, so uh, for many, many more examples, it's a, you know, it's a very interesting topic. And historically, this is a very interesting topic, how the computer has changed mathematics. And in particular, how it's changed pure mathematics, because it's clear the computer has changed applied mathematics, but uh, the computer has revolutionized pure mathematics as well. And Tom Hales wrote a beautiful article about this, Mathematics in the Age of the Turing Machine, uh, which I could recommend to anyone. And in fact, this is the first example in the paper. Uh, but, the, you know, but the problem with the people I work with, pure mathematicians, uh, is that they, they prove theorems. And uh, so you know, the natural extension of what we had then, this very, very primitive old computer, this very primitive slow computer, uh, computing a few examples of elliptic curves, these things, you know, these cubic equations are called elliptic curves. Now we have a gigantic database uh, created by computers. This, the, the database of L functions and modular forms that's available online. You know, it's, it's free and available online. And uh, there's 3 million elliptic curves in that database. And, uh, and you know, calculations have been done for many of them. The Birch, Swinnerton, and Dye conjecture has been checked. But uh, th there's a big problem with going on this way. There's, you know, at pure mathematicians now working on the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, they are not going to be looking at this database. Uh, 
because creating a database like this is never going to prove that theorem, right? The Birch and Swidditt and Dahl conjecture is a conjecture about all cubic equations in two variables. So it's a conjecture about infinitely many elliptic curves. And even if we've checked it for millions of elliptic curves, just computing more and more and more uh, is not going to prove the Birch and Swidditt and Dahl conjecture. Uh, and and you see, so the people I know that are working on trying to prove the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture, they don't use this database, right? The database is no use to them. Uh, the, the database is, is useful for other things, but it's not useful for proving the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture because you can't check it for all elliptic curves because there's infinitely many. So it's, it's funny, there's the people that are working, you know, on computations of elliptic curves, they use computers, but people that are working on, you know, trying to prove theorems about elliptic curves, maybe they're not, you know, maybe this database is useless to them. Uh, so this is a funny thing. There are pure mathematicians out there who are not really affected by the computer, right? There are people there who do not, and, you know, they cannot, they cannot use computers to do their research. Why, how, I mean, how can that be true? How can a mathematician not be able to use a computer to do their research because they're proving theorems about infinite sets, right? They want to prove theorems about all elliptic curves or all prime numbers, or they're proving theorems about infinite dimensional spaces. They're proving theorems about things that computers cannot model or, you know, traditional computers being used as computing machines. Uh, and it's these people here, these are my colleagues. These, are, these people are my colleagues. And so the big question is, Computers can certainly help with calculations, but can they help humans with their proofs? This is, you know, this is the fundamental question that I'm interested in as a pure mathematician. Uh, so, you know, can computers, can computers prove a theorem? Uh, so now I'm gonna play a computer game for a little while. I'm gonna show you uh, the kind of things I've been doing with the undergraduates I'm teaching, I've just finished teaching an undergraduate course uh, in elementary analysis. And, uh, and so here, uh, here is one of the problem sheets I gave my students. And I give them, I give them the problem sheets in this, uh, in this standard way. I give them a PDF. I give them a PDF. I'll, I just, just, I'm just going to tell my family uh, to close some doors because I can hear a lot of noise. Kez or mum? Can we, can we close some doors? Okay. Okay, they've become quieter. So this is, uh, this is one of two versions. So I give my students, you know, some PDF file with the questions on, but I also, but I also give my students uh, this computer file as well. And my students now have two options, right? They can solve the questions using pen and paper, the way that they do these things normally, or they can solve the questions uh, using this piece of software, this, this toy. And uh, the difference, of course, is, you know, I give them some calculations to do on paper and they write down the answers on a piece of paper. Uh, and then I can look at them and mark them. Or alternatively, they can try and solve these questions on a computer. And if they try and solve them on a computer, then, uh, then two, think, two, two very different, I mean, then the, th the story is different for two reasons. Uh, the first, the first reason it's different is that, uh, is that this now is not a puzzle on paper. This is, I'm giving a talk in Brazil. Can we close the doors? Uh, okay, no more noise. So firstly, um, the first reason it's different is that now this is a computer game. This is, no, this is no longer a puzzle they have to solve on paper. This is like the difference between solving a Sudoku on paper and solving a Sudoku uh, solving a Sudoku using an app, you know, where you can make mistakes and go back and you don't make a mess. If you try and solve a Sudoku in the newspaper, then you make some mistakes and you cross stuff out and it's a mess and you can't work with it. You know, it becomes a problem after a while, but you try and solve a Sudoku using, a, using an app on your phone. It's, you know, things go wrong, you can just go back. So it, this, makes, this makes solving this problem into a computer game. And secondly, uh, if the student gets it right, the computer tells them they've got it right, right? So I don't have to mark it. So this is a big advantage for me. Uh, the students don't need to know if they made a mistake. The computer tells them if they've made a mistake. So here's two basic questions in logic. 
uh, you know, and, and I'm beginning to teach these students logic. These are first year undergraduates and I need to teach them about quantifiers. You know, this, this question says for all X, you know, for all real numbers X, there exists a real number Y such that X plus Y is two. And one of the problems that students have is learning about these quantifiers and trying to, trying to get the hang of what's going on. So this is true, right? For all real numbers X, there exists a real number Y such that X plus Y is two. And the students, they need to, you know, here's, here's what's going on on the right here. We can see this is the problem. They've got to prove that if X is a real number, then there exists another real number Y such that X plus Y is true. And so I tell them to say, you know, let X be an arbitrary real number, right? Intro X. There, they need to learn a little bit of this language. So let X be an arbitrary real number. And now they've got to prove that there exists a real number Y such that X plus Y is two. And so which real number Y is going to work? Well, obviously Y is going to be two minus X. So we use two minus X. And now they've got to prove that X plus two minus X is true. And this is now obvious, right? Because we can just simplify this equation. We can simplify the left-hand side and it becomes equal to the right-hand side. So we, we run simp and now we get, this, you know, we get this success message. Our goals are accomplished. And this is a proof of this theorem. And now here, we have another very, very similar question. Is it true that there exists a Y such that for all X, X plus Y is two? This is the same question, right? Because it, we have X can vary and we have to find a Y such that X plus Y is true. But in fact, it's not the same question. It's a different question. So we try to use the same proof. We're gonna use Y is two minus X, right? Use two minus X. But this time we get an error. <laughs> And we get an error because X is, there's no X, right? The error says there's no X. I can't find an X. And, uh, and that's because you see, this is something that undergraduates at my university struggle with, right? They say, well, of course Y exists because Y can be two minus X, but there is no X, right? The X comes later. So they say, they try to say, well, let's let Y be two minus X. It's no good, it doesn't work, right? You have to let Y be something, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to use a number like 37. And now this is problematic because now this is not true, you see. So the students can begin to learn that switching the order of the quantifiers around changes the question. So this software, for certain students that engage with the software, many students don't want to use it, right? But for the students that like computers and they like this idea, they can learn in a new way. They can learn in a different way. This is teaching my undergraduates you know, to think logically and to think carefully. And in fact, this question is not true, right? You have to change this. This question is false there. And they should prove that this is not true, right? We prove that this is, this is not true. And now this is a different, this is now a different level of this computer game. And now they can try and prove this level instead. And I think we've seen enough now. You know, you have some kind of idea of what's going on, but uh, you know, if, if, give, if you gave me a, a minute or two, I could construct a proof of this. I could solve this level of this computer game. Every single sorry here, is a level of a computer game. There are things like this. Students find it very difficult when I start talking about for all X in the empty set or there exists an X in the empty set because the empty set has no elements. So this is quite confusing for them. But if they do these questions like this, it kind of helps them, you know, it helps them to think more logically about what's going on. So that's a toy and we can use this toy uh, to do undergraduate mathematics. And it was written by Leonard, you know, as Alexandra already mentioned, it's written by a Brazilian, uh, written by Leonardo de Moura, who now works at Microsoft Research. And, uh, you know, so one interesting question is why, why is somebody writing that, you know, why is, right, why is somebody at Microsoft writing such a toy? Uh, and, uh, and secondly, what does it do, right? So in 2016, this was the kind of mathematics that this stuff, that this, uh, that this toy could do, the lean proof assistant it's called. And this was the kind of things it, it could prove, it could prove stuff by induction. It could prove the square root of two was irrational, you know, basic, basic stuff that we teach to the first years. Uh, and it was also very hard to use, right? Because you have to see, you have, first of all, you have to learn a new language. And this isn't some language like C or, you know, or Java, some standard language, you have to learn a new language, this language lean. Uh, and it was also very hard to install uh, because, you know, because mathematicians are not often experts with computers. They want to go to some website and click some button that says install, and then some magic happens in the background. 
and it's installed. It wasn't like this with Lean. Lean was hard to install. And the instructions were hard to find and the instructions would change as people wrote more software to try and make it easier. Uh, and as I say, it could do basic stuff. It could do induction, for example. Uh, so if you, could, if you could manage to install the software on the system, then you could get the students to do basic examples of induction. Uh, but this talk is about what's happened over the last four years with this software, Lean in 2020. And now Lean in 2020 is quite different. So what can Lean do now? Uh, well, the first thing to stress is that Lean cannot do, it cannot, or Lean 3, I, sh I should say, Lean 3 is not a computer. Like Lean 3 should not really be used to do big computations. You know, I'm, I'm a number theorist. I would, you know, I sometimes have to factor large numbers, right? That's a, you know, a very common thing that shows up, shows up in cryptography, you know, shows up in the basic number theory course. We think about factorizations, but I wouldn't want to use lean to factorize a large number or to do the kind of things that Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer were doing in the 1960s, to even try and compute all the solutions to these equations. Lean was not designed to do computing. I mean, it is a computer program, but it wasn't designed to do numerical computations like this. It can do them, but it might do them quite slowly. Lean three might do them very slowly. Lean four might be a different thing, but lean four, Leo is still working on lean four. We don't have it yet. I wouldn't want to use lean three to do computations, but I want to use lean three to check my proofs. You know, me as a researcher, uh, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to teach this system complicated mathematics harder than induction. So that's the next big question, right? What kind of mathematics can this stuff understand? How, how good are these toys? And how good in particular is lean? Uh, you know, can it do the first year problem sheets? Well, yes, it can. We saw it doing them, you know, but, but what about the third year problem sheets? What about my third year number theory course? Can this software, you know, or any software, all this proof verification software, can it do third year undergraduate pure mathematics problem sheets? Or can it do MSc level mathematics? Or can it do research level mathematics? You know, what, what, can, these, what can these systems do now? And, uh, you know, because they certainly know the axioms, right? This problem was solved 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we had basic systems that knew the axioms of mathematics. Uh, and they're also capable of learning mathematics, right? We can develop libraries so they can learn mathematics if we teach it to them. You know, when, when will they start being able to figure out mathematics by themselves? That's a big question. I'm not a computer scientist, right? This is a very interesting question. If we teach Lean enough mathematics, then can we say to the AI people, you know, the machine learning people, here's a big database of mathematics. Can you go ahead and see what you can do? You know, can, you, can you start getting these systems to think? Uh, but that's something I really don't want to talk about. It's an interesting question, but I'm not an expert at all in that area. I know nothing about machine learning or AI. You know, and I know very little about computer programming, to be honest. Uh, so these systems will learn mathematics if we teach it them. But the question is, who's going to teach them? I mean, one thing I do know about AI is that machine learning seems to often work better if you have a database, right? So where is the database of mathematics? You know, where are the mathematicians that are making this database? And this is a problem, right? This is a toy. You know, the, I, the students see it, it's a toy. But the staff see it. I'm doing undergraduate mathematics, right? This is a toy. So Swinnerton Dyer died last year. You know, he was very old. Uh, and I went to his memorial service in Cambridge and I saw Birch, his co-author, who's another number theorist. He's someone I've known. I mean, he was, my, he was one of the examiners for my PhD thesis. I've known him for a while. And I told him that I'd switched now and I wasn't doing traditional number theory. I'd got interested in teaching mathematics to computers. And the first thing he asked me, this 80 year old, doddery 80 year old man, you know, he's a very frail man. And this was his first, really, this was his only question. Can it tell us anything new? And the answer is that currently it cannot tell us anything new, right? It, it cannot prove a theorem that humans can't prove. You know, this would be wonderful if it happened, but we're a long way from these systems telling us something new. And, and because of that, instantly, you know, Birch loses interest, right? And most of the mathematicians in my department, most of the researchers in my department 
they lose interest, right? It can't do computations and it can't tell us a new theorem. So it's of no use, right? And this is not just true at my university, this is true across the world. Pure mathematicians, you know, the applied mathematicians are using computers all the time. And many pure mathematicians are using computers. We're computing many examples, but there are pure mathematicians that computers cannot reach currently. Pure mathematicians that want to prove big theorems about infinite sets. And the computers can only check examples. They can't prove the theorem. So the pure mathematicians don't use these systems. And so the systems do not learn mathematics because the only people working with them are computer scientists. And computer scientists, of course, they know some mathematics, but they don't know what's going on. They don't know research mathematics. So this is a big problem. And because I'm talking in a mathematics department now, here's some examples of these computer proof assistants, you know, computer, computer programs that can be used to check proofs. Lean and Koch, Isabel, Mizar, Hall Light, Metamath. And if you talk to people in my math department, I mean, I don't, I don't know your math department well, but in my math department, many people have never heard of any of these systems. I mean, they've heard about Lean because I keep talking about Lean all the time, right? but uh, they, you know, probably they never saw it. Uh, so you can compare this with the kind of software that mathematicians do use, computer algebra packages that can do computations like integrals and you know, manipulation of polynomials and numerical approximations, Maple and MATLAB and Mathematica, and Sage and Gap and Parry. You know, I would imagine that many of you have heard or, or even use one or more of these systems because these, are, you know, these systems are used in mathematics departments. So if pure mathematicians, if they've been designed to prove theorems and pure mathematicians aren't using them, then why do these systems even exist, right? Why is Leonardo de Mura working for Microsoft writing these systems that can check theorems, but the guys that, that check the theorems and prove the theorems, they're not using them. Why do these systems even exist? Uh, because they want to use them for a, a completely different reason, right? They want to use them that, they want to use them to check that code has got no bugs. That's the, that's the big, this is a billion dollar industry, right? If you have a bug in your code, then maybe a system is going to fail and maybe that, you know, maybe that system will cause a million dollars worth of damage. You know, this, the Pentium bug, the, the Pentium division bug, cost, cost, cost Pentium, uh, cost Intel you know, uh, half a billion dollars. This is a huge amount of money, right? Computers, are, computers run the world, right? Code runs the world. Code is what's keeping airplanes in the sky. If code has got bugs in, this can cause real problems. You know, code is keeping people, code is running all these ventilators that are keeping people alive. Uh, in the hospitals around the world. So it's very important to have systems that verify that code has got no bugs. And more and more people in computer science are using these things. But there's something called the Curry-Howard correspondence, which means that the art, you know, the act of checking that a, that a, a computer a, a proof has got no bugs is the same as checking that a program has no bugs. Proofs and programs are strongly related to each other. So. Uh, so it's kind of a coincidence, really, that these systems can be used to check that code, to check that uh, proofs have got no bugs, because really they were designed for something else. But now they're being used to check that, uh, that mathematical theorems have got no errors in. And many, you know, more and more systems are appearing all the time. People write new systems. Leo's is not the only system. And, uh, and they, you know, they all, tinker, they change a little bit, what the axioms are what, are, what are the real axioms of mathematics? You know, people have different opinions about this. So slightly, you know, should we use set theory? Should we use type theory? You know, logicians experiment with different systems and uh, many, many systems get written, but, uh, and then the computer scientists and the logicians are using them to prove, you know, basic theorems or theorems in mathematical logic. But in my country, at least, Mathematical logic is not a big part of what's happening in the mathematics departments in the UK. The mathematics departments in the UK are full of people like me, number theorists, geometers, analysts, you know, algebraists, uh, topologists, people like that. Uh, not so much logicians. The logicians are working in computer science departments. So what's happening in mathematics departments is not at all reflected in what's happening in these computer proof systems. So, you know, serious mathematicians, the mathematicians that are winning the prizes, 
the Fields medals, you know, this most prestigious medal in mathematics. Mathematicians are not using these things. Uh, and my, my, you know, the point of my talk really is that this has to change, right? Something has to change. And I think it's time that things change because I think these systems can offer a lot to the mathematics community and in particular to pure mathematicians and in particular to mathematicians that don't normally use computers. So every single one of these systems, you know, has got basic, has got basic mathematical theorems in. Uh, but more and more, we're beginning to see highly non-trivial theorems. So on this slide, I'm going to show you some really, really difficult mathematical theorems that have been checked by these computer proof systems. So the prime number theorem uh, you know, was a very famous theorem proved 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago, about how many prime numbers are there less than n. Number of prime numbers less than n is n over log n. And this has been verified in two systems. And the four color theorem, this is a, you know, the theorem about coloring maps. You can, uh, you can take a map of the countries in South America and you can color in the different countries in four different colors and no two countries that touch each other will have the same color. Uh, this was proved in Cock. And the odd order theorem is a very deep theorem about finite groups. Every finite group of odd order is solvable. Uh, this was proved by John Thompson, and uh, it was one of the reasons he got a Fields Medal in uh, 1970. Uh, so the Kepler conjecture, this is a famous old mathematical conjecture about, uh, about packing spheres into boxes. How, how tightly can you pack a collection of spheres into three-dimensional space? And this was proved first using pencil and paper, uh, but then using Isabel Hall. The proof was checked using, uh, using some of these systems. And these are, these are serious, uh, these are serious mathematical, uh, you know, serious mathematical work. And then recently there was a paper, a proof, a proof of a, conje a combinatorial conjecture was proved by Ellenberg and Geisweit. And this proof was published in the Annals of Maths, you know, the top pure maths journal. And, uh, and the lean community thought, well, why don't we, why don't we check that? Uh, so they checked it in lean. So what's going on here? If we can prove all these amazing theorems uh, in these theorem provers, then why aren't mathematicians interested? And the, the, problem with these, uh, the problem with these theorems and proofs is that these are very low level. These are about, these are about simple objects. Right? The prime number theorem is a theorem about prime numbers. The odd order theorem is a theorem about finite groups. You know, the Kepler conjecture is a conjecture about spheres and uh, this is the cap, the cap set conjecture is a, is a theorem about finite sets, right? All of these proofs are about very, very simple objects. And uh, most mathematicians working in my department, they work with extremely complex objects, right? We can, we can, do, we can do very, very long and difficult theorems about simple objects. Uh, but I know many mathematicians that are not excited by this kind of mathematics, you know? They're excited by complex, mathematical objects, the kind of things that people do research into now. And uh, so this is a proof that the systems are not toys, right? They can understand complicated theorems about simple objects, but this is, this is not enough. Mathematicians know these things are done in these proofs and mathematicians don't care, right? This is a problem. Mathematicians don't care about these theorems. They think, well, a big deal, you know, I could check them, you know, the, the proofs are long and boring. You know, the proof of the four color theorem involves checking 2000 special cases. You know, two, two, you check that 2000 graphs work and then, you, and then by some clever induction, you prove that all graphs work. So these systems are not toys, but it's, this is not enough. Pure mathematicians don't buy them yet, right? So what do these systems have to offer mathematicians? So these systems have existed for a long time, but I don't think they've been marketed very well. So I'm interested in marketing, right? I'm interested in marketing these systems to mathematicians. I'm interested in advertising these systems. And here's, and here's when, I came, you know, when I came in in 2016, and even now in 2020, let's look at all of the systems. Let's look at every single system. Which of the systems knows an undergraduate maths curriculum? Which of these systems could understand the questions, not solve them, not solve them. Which of them could even understand the questions on, a, on the final exams, which we set our undergraduates? And the answer is none of them, right? 
because computer scientists have not been trying to do undergraduate level mathematics, basic undergraduate level mathematics, because undergraduate level mathematics has complicated stuff in like has manifolds, has algebraic number fields, things like this, you know, more complicated objects. So how many of them could even, you know, the third year number theory class that I teach, you know, I teach them basic facts. Some of these basic facts go back to Gauss and Euler. How many of them could even state all of the theorems in that class that I teach? None of them can do that, right? So this, this slide is showing that there's a big problem here because we have these fantastic systems that have demonstrated they can do all kinds of complicated mathematics. And yet, can they do an undergraduate mathematics degree? No, they cannot even understand the question. And this is a problem because, because it means that the databases that these AI researchers have are very, very restricted. These AI people want to teach computers to do modern mathematics. They want to answer Brian Birch's question, right? Birch says, can they tell us something new? They want us, you know, we want these systems to start telling mathematicians new theorems. But if they can't even, if they don't even know the undergraduate curriculum, then, then there is no chance, right? So we're working on it slowly. And within a few weeks, we're gonna be able to state the theorems that I, that, I proved to the, you know, that I proved to my class. And in a few months time, we're gonna be able to prove them. And why is that kind of thing happening now? It could have happened 30 years ago. Why is it happening now? Why are computers beginning to learn you know, the theorems in my number theory class? It's because I've given up on the staff. I just, I think, we. The staff are not ready for these systems. I think we should teach the undergraduates these systems. And indeed, as Alexander was telling me, apparently this is what you're doing, right? I think this is a really important step. We need to teach the undergraduates. We should just give up on the staff. The staff are just old and they like the pencil and paper way. If we teach the undergraduates, then slowly what will happen is that these systems will become more normal. They will learn more undergraduate stuff. And then the undergraduates will grow up. They'll become PhD students. And these systems will learn PhD mathematics because the undergraduates have spent their entire life working with computers. The undergraduates use computers for everything. And the undergraduates are much more receptive to the idea that we should be doing mathematics with computers. They think it's a cool idea. So if we train the undergraduates, then after a while, we just wait and maybe suddenly there will be a paradigm shift. You know, maybe suddenly, suddenly people will start using these systems to do really interesting things, things that maybe I can't even imagine, right? We are digitizing mathematics. We are digitizing serious, the kind of mathematics we teach to the undergraduates. And later on, we'll be digitizing the kind of mathematics we teach to the MSc students and the PhD students. We are digitizing mathematics. And if that happens, then new things will begin to happen, you know, in new, things will happen. I can't guess what will happen, right? But things will happen. You know, we digitized, we digitized music, and then we had the MP3 player, and then we had Spotify, right? And that has changed the lives of my children. We digitized music, it changed the lives of many, many people. We digitized books, it changed the lives of many, many people. I suggest that we digitize mathematics, and we see what happens, right? So, how, how is this going to happen? The first step, I think, before anybody will take us seriously, we have to teach it an undergraduate pure mathematics curriculum. Because I want to reach the pure mathematicians. And, and this is happening, right? We have a list of all the theorems uh, in a standard undergraduate, in a standard undergraduate curriculum in France. And this is essentially the same as what is taught in the UK. You know, somebody wrote, wrote the statements of all these theorems. And uh, we've, you know, uh, that's not even true. We just wrote, we just wrote it in PDF. Yeah, we have, we have the ideas of what needs to be done. And people are working hard on this, undergraduates work on this. So these are the kinds of things, you know, these are the kinds of things that we have. You know, the, the, these are typical things that we teach our undergraduates, you know, groups, rings and fields in the pure courses. Uh, there are things we don't have. Quadratic reciprocity, this is a, you know, one of the main things we teach. And one of the main things we teach uh, in, in the number theory course I teach. And this has, been, this has been done. One of the undergraduates put quadratic reciprocity into lean. You know, which numbers are the sums of squares? Basic questions 
that were being studied hundreds of years ago. And there's geometry as well. This isn't just discrete mathematics. You know, we think of computers as being discrete things. We're doing continuous things, right? We're teaching them geometry, metric and topological spaces, the basic theory of manifolds, you know, these fundamentally important mathematical objects, real manifolds. Many, many questions in mathematics turn out to be questions about manifolds, you know, behavior of points on a manifold or a flow on a manifold, or you know, the answer to some question could be thought of as a manifold. The collection of answers to a question uh, could be thought of as a manifold. We haven't done complex manifolds yet. Riemann surfaces, we have nothing for Riemann surfaces, one dimensional complex manifolds. But you know, we have a lot of analysis you know, a lot of the basic theory of integrals, you know, these things, you understand, we're not approximating integrals. We're not proving, you know, we're trying to integrate sine of x from zero to pi by two. We're not, we're not, we're not chopping this up into many, many small pieces and then computing an approximation. We're proving that that integral is one, you know, because we prove, we prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we prove that the, you know, the integral of, uh, the integral of sine is negative cos and cos of pi by two, cos of pi by two is zero. That's the definition of pi. We don't use floats. We use real, real numbers, Cauchy sequences, uh, modulo equivalents. So we're developing analysis, but you know, proof, not computationally, we're developing it. We're developing some theory of proofs. So how are the undergraduates learning this stuff? It's because I'm teaching them, right? I run a club on Thursdays. I run a club and, we'd, and I'm teaching them. And all it takes is one staff member. You know, Alexandra tells me he's, he's using the natural number game to teach undergraduates. All you need is one person in your department. And then suddenly you might get undergraduates that are interested. And after a while, there's gonna be books, right? There's gonna be toys, there's gonna be tools. And maybe I'm just gonna find that undergraduates can begin to learn things by themselves. There's no staff members in Cambridge University. No staff members are interested in this stuff. But a couple of PhD students are, and that's all we need. We have PhD students, and now the undergraduates are beginning to learn. So that's how we're going to get undergraduate maths in. We're going to tell the undergraduates how to do it. And then, of course, after that, we need MSc students. But I've been working on undergraduate mathematics for several years now, and now I can start teaching MSc students to do MSc level mathematics. So the system is slowly growing and we are putting stuff into lean that has been put into no other theorem prover. And the staff don't care, right? Because MSc level mathematics is easy, right? It's all trivial. Who cares about MSc level mathematics? But it's just slowly progressing. I have three MSc students this year and they're all people that started with me. They're, it's not a coincidence. They all, they all started learning as first years when I was teaching the first years. And now I have three fourth years doing serious mathematics in Lean. And to stress test the system, we know that these systems could understand very, very long theorems about simple objects. So we, des we decided to prove some very, very simple theorems about very complex objects. So we defined a perfectoid space, me and two collaborators. We spent eight months of our life teaching, uh, teaching Lean what a perfectoid space was, which is you know, this complicated, uh, object that Peter Schultz invented. And then he used perfectoid spaces to prove many profound theorems. He proved complicated theorems using complicated objects, right? That's something that we don't have yet. We have complicated theorems about simple objects. Schultz approved complicated theorems about complicated objects, perfectoid spaces. So we don't have any complicated theorems about complicated objects, but we do have simple theorems about complicated objects. So that's something, right? So most of what I've said so far can apply to all of the theorem provers. You know, I'm not saying lean is the best one. Lean is the one that I am using. So this slide is just explaining why I think lean is a little bit different to the others. So firstly, it's backed by Microsoft. I mean, I should also say it's written by a genius, right? Your, your Ale Alexandra's friend is a genius. He wrote Z3, which is a very powerful piece of software. And now he's written Lean. So it's backed by Microsoft. So there's very, very smart, and it's not just Leo, there's other smart people at Microsoft that are really pushing this software. They're working on Lean 4. And uh, so there's seriously smart people writing the code. And secondly, the big difference between Lean and the other systems is some mathematicians are using Lean. For example, me, but there's other people, just a few, you know, there are 10, 
currently there are 10 serious mathematicians using lean at 10 universities around the world, which means there are 10 groups of undergraduates that are slowly, you know, there's, there's a really, maybe 20, you know, it just grows all the time. It's a small number, but it's growing all the time. And also, of course, it depends what do you mean by a mathematician? You know, there are PhD students, there are postdocs, there are staff members, but uh, you know, there's not so many of us now, but more and more people just come along all the time. And because, because mathematicians are using it, it's being pushed in different directions to these other provers. You know, we're defining complex objects. We're defining perfectoid spaces, real manifolds. I'm interested in algebraic geometry. You know, it's a very big thing in pure mathematics. Alexandre Grothendieck, he, he, he made this scheme. You know, this was one of my first projects. I defined a scheme in Lean. Me and two undergraduates, we worked together. I did a project with undergraduates. It's very exciting. I've never done that as a pure mathematician. I know the applied mathematicians work with undergraduates, but for pure mathematicians, the interesting questions are just too difficult for undergraduates to understand. But this is MSc level mathematics. We taught, we taught Lean what a scheme was. And when we finished doing it, my first question was, how are schemes done in the other theorem provers? Because we ran into problems, right? We ran into problems and we had to learn to solve the problems. So when we'd solved the problems, because Lean could solve those problems, we said, how is it done in the other, in the other systems? And it's not there. None of the other systems have schemes. Schemes have been around for 50 years. These systems have been around for 50 years. Schemes are MSc level mathematics, and there are no schemes in any of these systems. Well, Lean has schemes now. And uh, another, big, another big help, and Alexandra, I'm sure, will agree with me, is there is a 24 7 helpline. If you have a question about Lean, you're trying to do mathematics in Lean or programming in Lean, if you're stuck, you can just show up on this helpline and ask this question, and people come along and answer your questions. And it's a very friendly community. Right now, we're very lucky. There's no idiots there. It's a friendly community. There's nobody who's rude. There's nobody who yells at the beginners. People, people are very, very keen to see this software grow. People are very, very helpful. If you want to try experimenting with Lean, then you know, think of a theorem or think of a project. Try it. Get stuck. Ask here. People are going to help you very, very quickly. You know, it's, it, it, it used to be just a very small group of people, but now there's a very large group of people through maths and computer science, there's mathematicians and computer scientists working together and they're solving a lot of problems here. So where is this going? Well, it would be nice to say it's gonna save, the, you know, it's gonna start proving new theorems. Maybe, will it prove the Birch, Swinnerton, and Dyer conjecture? No, not yet. But we need to look at more realistic goals. So can we use these tools to teach? I think we can, right? People are experimenting all over the world. People are trying to use these tools for teaching. And can we use these ideas to get better search? If we, don't, if we don't teach it the proofs, but if we teach one of these systems a lot of mathematical statements, can we teach it lots and lots of statements? And then can we, and can we get the computer to start putting statements together? You, know, you ask, is this known? Well, yeah, it follows simply from these two difficult theorems. So can we, can we start, if, if a mathematician wants to know, if a mathematician wants to know, is this theorem proved? They don't Google it, this is useless. If it's a difficult modern theorem, or they, they start asking their friends, they ask the people in the office next to them, they ask, their, they ask their colleagues. If a mathematician wants to know the state of the art, you know, Google doesn't work so well for that. The, the, you know, or Bing, these things, these search engines don't work so great for searching for technical mathematical theorems. Uh, but I wonder whether these computers will actually give us a better tool for better search. If people started formalizing just the statements, then we could start making a very big graph. Formalizing statements of theorems is not difficult, right? Formalizing proofs takes a long time, but formalizing statements is, uh, is not so difficult. And if we have a big graph of statements, then this is just the kind of thing that we can do. Like we have very smart search algorithms that can start looking for relevant statements and maybe start putting them together. You know, we have sledgehammers. We have interactive theorem prover sledgehammers. And Tom Hales, Tom Hales, who's a big shot in this area, he proved the Kepler conjecture. He's now working on making a natural language so that mathematicians will be able to understand statements of these theorems. You know, people that, there are many people that find this stuff very, very scary. But if we could start writing things in a natural language, then uh, maybe more mathematicians would get interested.
And if we could start persuading mathematicians to state their theorems in this kind of software, maybe this stuff will begin to grow more. So Hales is using lead. He's trying to make a natural language interface for Loon. But it won't work until we have all the definitions. And, uh, you know, we're still, we can't, we, you know, we now we have a definition of a manifold, but two years ago we did not, right? There's still many standard mathematical objects that we don't have definitions of in these systems. So can, you know, this is the next, the, the next thing afterwards, can we start making a system that begins to think for itself, that proves basic lemmas? Is this, is this crazy, this idea? Well, Scott, Mor Scott Morrison, uh, he's one of the founders of Math Overflow and uh, he works at ANU in Australia and he's working on this. He's thinking about this in category theory, a very abstract branch of pure mathematics. He's trying to get these systems to prove basic lemmas. And he's, you know, one of his recent successes, he told, he told Lean the statement of a famous lemma in category theory. And lo and behold, he got Lean to find that proof automatically. Lean generated the proof. You know, it took a couple of seconds, but it found the proof for him. This is a very simple lemma, but this is the beginning. Right. This is the beginning. They, you know, we have an example of a famous mathematical statement that the computer did not know anything about. Right. It didn't cheat. The lemma was not there in the library. We told it the statement and it followed its nose and it found a proof. So in summary, then, I think that there's mounting evidence that these systems are going to be changing soon. Right. We know already they can understand complex proofs about simple objects. But we're beginning to see them now understanding simple proofs about complex objects. And uh, really, you know, one next big thing we need to check is can they understand complicated proofs about complicated objects? And before we know that, we need to teach it the undergraduate curriculum. Uh, so this is work in progress, but that's where we're going. And uh, really, you know, me, if I want to market this software, you know, one big question is what will impress the mathematicians next? What should I make that will make mathematicians interested? But this is a hard problem. But what I've understood, what I've learned now is that it's actually much more, it's much more easy to get the undergraduates interested. So I'm going to start with the undergraduates. I now have my first PhD student in this area. Somebody said, I want to spend, you know, I want to spend the next three years formalizing some Ibasawa theory, you know, complicated algebraic number theory. And I'm hoping that this kind of thing will start to make mathematicians notice, but this is a difficult problem. But fortunately, two weeks ago, I just got funding to digitize the Langlands philosophy, which is a very serious part of modern pure mathematics. So I'm not entirely sure what we're gonna do here, but, uh, in, but I'm gonna have a postdoc working full time on doing serious mathematics in Lean. I'll teach them Lean, they'll know the mathematics. And you know, again, we're just gonna make new things you know, the natural number game is a little thing I made, a little toy. Uh, we're going to make we're going to make some more things, and uh, so I'm going to finish with some adverts. I have a blog, and uh, and the natural number game is a fun is a fun thing. The undergraduates like it, you know. And I'm on Twitter, and so is Microsoft Research, and I'm beginning to run little undergraduate courses, undergraduate classes on a Discord server. If you know what Discord is, it, my kids use it. You know, I, I have tea. I'm lucky. I have children who are the same age as my undergraduates. So I have some insight into the kind of the kind of stuff that kids do, the kind of software that kids are using. So they use Discord. So I moved on to Discord. You know, we can't meet in real life now, but we're meeting on Discord every every week. And if you're if you know undergraduates who are in mathematics undergraduates who want to just do some playing with Lean or learn some basic stuff about Lean. If you get in touch, I can send them, you know, this is a private Discord server, but I would happily send invites to undergraduate mathematicians. And uh, really that's the end of everything I have to say. Uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for listening. And over the next few years, I think, you know, hopefully we will begin to see this software changing the behavior of all mathematics, all mathematicians, but uh, who knows? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin, for the presentation. So uh, yeah, we ask people to raise the hand or write in the chat if they have questions to Kevin. Uh, 
how do you why do you want people to um, to ask you for a question in the chat or by raising hands? Go ahead, Bob. Just Go ahead, Walter. <laughs> you can, yeah, just ask. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Kevin. Very much interesting. Uh, I I have a small experience in improving things on. Uh, actually, I did a work with a colleague of mine proving something in logic, uh -huh. right? Proving, for instance, that a certain kind of logic or a consistent logic is not able to prove Gödel's theorem. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. So it's it involves a, a bit of modal logic and finding counterexamples and uh, trying to find definitions and so on. But the question is, we did not know what, what to do. So Leo, uh, Leo uh, seems to be, not Leo, uh, Lean uh, seems to be very hard to implement, to, to, to put this on computer for people that have no experience. So we used the, uh, Isabel. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, we found that it, it's, uh, we were expecting some some kind of a colleague that would do proofs for us, kind of automatic colleague, but it, it did not happen that way. So <laughs> we have that it was a, a kind of a very nice assistant to find the counter examples more than anything, right? So, but now my question is for you: How when you say to teach mathematics to computers, you 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 mean teaching them the theory, formalizing a big theory, or feeding them with proofs? so that they can figure out by themselves, like in uh, machine learning or acting with big data, like it, you know, like this kind of movement using big data and probability and statistics instead of a yeah. logic side of it. So uh, yeah, all, all of the above is the answer to your question. I, I think we should try everything, but, but because it's very easy to try all of the things you suggested, right? I mean, it's a, they're all big projects, but there's no technical obstructions. We could, we could teach these systems the statements of theorems. We could teach these systems the proofs of theorems. All we need you know, is 100 people working for 10 years. So somehow, this is the problem, is that there are, there are many people that do logic and category theory. You know, this, this foundational, the foundations of mathematics these, these people do use these systems. There, there is much logic done in Isabel and in Koch. And, uh, and my impression is that it, in my country, at least, logicians are disappearing. They are dying out and they're not being replaced. I was an undergraduate in Cambridge and mm. I, was taught, I was taught by Peter Johnston and Martin Highland, you know, two serious, you know, a serious logician and a serious category theorist. And they were, you know, five years ago, they were both still there, but mm -hmm. no one else was hired. And now they've both retired and they're not being replaced. The, the, the mathematicians are more and more not thinking about logic. The logicians I know are often in computer science departments now. Yeah. And, and the, the problem is just doing more logic is, is not going to make mathematicians I, I want to do any of the things you said, any of them or all of them, but I think it's very important that we start doing the kind of mathematics that they give the Fields Medals for. And the last time they gave a Fields Medal for logic was um, Cohen, Cohen forcing. And that's, that's 50 years ago, right? So I, I, want to try every, I want to try everything. I don't know what will work, but let's try just teaching it a big database of theorems, or let's try teaching is a smaller database of theorems and proofs, and then let's see what the AI does. But I, I think that to make mathematicians interested, we have to move away from logic, not because logic isn't interesting, but because mathematicians are, in my country at least, are beginning to think more, you know, logic is somehow not what mathematicians in my department are doing. Mm. This is the problem. We have, we have a model theorist. We, hired a, we, ha we have two model theorists now. But five years ago, we had no model theorists and it's, it's difficult mm -hmm. to find them. So yeah, teach, teach them everything. The, the problem is who will teach them? That's the problem, not what should we do. The problem is how the heck are we gonna do it? Because we need people. And this is, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make people interested. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, everything, we should, we should teach, we should make a database, but before we can make the data, we have to make it by hand. 
So we need to find the people. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. Uh -huh. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's fine. I, I heard that there are some people that are using sort of a machine learning or big data approach to solve the integral that one, one thing you said it's hard to do. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's very hard to differentiate is easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mathematics, differentiation is a, do that, but to integrate is much harder, right? It, differentiation are, is a science and integration yeah. is an art. <laughs> yeah, they are teaching uh, computers to do like a, by correlations and analogy and so on and to solve the hard integrals. Yeah, is there yeah, yeah. another movement that you know in, in this direction, like people feeding computers with, let's say, theorems in category theory and making them to sort of uh, generalize a little bit or to make inductions? Natural inductions, I mean. So I, I am not an AI expert, but I do know that there are large category theory databases now because it's the, it's the foundational people that are using them, right? People have done a lot of category theory. In Koch, uh, I think Voivodsky spent a lot of time yeah, doing yeah, category yeah. theory yeah. in Koch. But I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know if the AI people are. I don't, yeah, I don't know if the AI people are trying to use this. I've, I've, be, I've been to talks by machine learning people and the big problem they seem to have is that they really want a nice big database and they always go back to the same thing. They go back to these, they go back to these big, you know, if they're trying to do mathematics, they go back to these big mathematical proofs that just prove one theorem. You know, mm -hmm. they go back, they go to the odd order theorem and they say, oh, now we have, you know, 10, you know, we have a thousand lemmas about groups here. Maybe mm -hmm. these can be useful. Maybe we can train the computer to, to learn lots of things about groups. But there's a big problem with that odd order database. There's a very big problem with it because um, the, the big theorem they prove is that every group, they prove that every group with odd order, you know, is solvable. They prove that there's no simple group of odd order. And mm -hmm. so many, many of the proofs the, the proof is by contradiction, right? They assume, they assume that there's a group with this property, yeah. and then they prove many, many, many things about it. And finally, they prove it doesn't exist. And so all of those theorems are about groups that don't exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very difficult to learn from them because somehow already the big theorem is known. These, these groups don't exist. So we know a thousand facts about them, including the fact that they don't exist. And in some yeah. sense, that, that, that makes these other facts useless. So it's, okay. it's difficult to find a good, coherent, big database that we can train on or that they can train on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I want to make it by hand. And, but I Kevin, want to make so, it, yeah, sorry, go. So no, no, go, go ahead, just conclude your thought. I, I was, I want to make it by hand and it will take a long time, but at the yeah. end of it, it, it will be about the kind of mathematics that mathematicians recognize now, the kind of mathematics happening in my department. You know, and unfortunately, mostly that is not logic and category theory. I want the Fields Medal Committee to at least look up and say, oh, that's the mathematics I do. Uh, one, 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 one comment, maybe, I don't know, Alexander, if you have other people waiting, just a comment. I mean, uh, maybe no problem, it would, it would be heritating uh, the kind of the philosophy of mathematics that you do, because, you know, uh, uh, like uh, Isabel uses uh, type theory, okay, classical yeah. type theory. Other yeah, yeah. systems like Koch use intuitionistic type theory. Yeah. I don't know about the lean. Dependent Does it, type is theory. It, uh, high order logic or? No, it's, it's, a, it's, dependent, it's dependent type theory and also <sighs> quotients. Yeah. It's qu quotients in built into the kernel. Uh, but the big difference between Koch and lean, it's basically the same foundations. It's, it's dependent type theory. But one big difference is that we are not doing constructive mathematics intuitionistic intuition. We that's that's another big difference between what in the real a real mathematician in a mathematics department today. If mm. they're not a logician, then they are probably not doing constructive mathematics. They they are probably using the axiom of choice and uh, you know, all yeah. the time. Yeah, sure. They, they are they are not doing uh, constructive mathematics, and so. Yeah. One very important thing about lean is that you know, the axiom of choice is built in and we use it all the time. We're not, we're not trying to compute, we're trying to prove. And, and so this is another change of emphasis, which I'm hoping will, you know, will, will, will change things. 
he's gone Gontier proved this odd order theorem and the proof is completely constructive and uh, he you know he, I think he's very pleased about this and he explains this but many mathematicians that I know the algebraists and the geometers and the topologists they don't know what constructive mathematics is I didn't know what it was five years ago <laughs> it's, it's they're not doing into it in, yeah intuitionistic stuff they're doing very very classical mathematics and so these mm. systems need to learn classical mathematics this is precisely amazing how how means dealing with these two words right because for the computer scientists the constructive view is much more interesting it's really because of the connection <laughs> exactly and the whole connection of functional programming and 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 yeah, yeah stuff yeah. right so it's amazing how to put these two things together and people using the same tool that his ability to, to... It, it, it is extraordinary you see look look what's happening here i'm writing proofs using tactics and i i'm not creating the tactics i'm just using the tactics to do mathematics mm -hmm. but the guys that are writing the tactics for them constructive mathematics is it, the constructivism is extremely important whereas but it's somehow all behind some interface and I'm, I'm not training mathematicians to look there. I'm just saying, you know, here are these tactics. Don't worry about how they work. I'll tell you what they do. Right? Here's how to think about the tactic. You hover over the tactic and you see the, you see the documentation. And they don't worry about how it works. Right? They don't even really need to think about type theory. You know, they just understand that R is the real numbers and they don't really care if it's a set or a type. You know, we, we're working... We, we have here a, a very beautiful interface where mathematicians who know nothing about constructivism and nothing about type theory can still can still prove theorems. That's what you see if you've seen the natural number game, right? There's no mention of type theory there. And no mention of constructivism and no mention about definitional equality or anything like that. It's 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 showing them they're just applying theorems. This is what we do, right? We apply theorems. I have a question here from Oliver. He he asked you about the you mentioned that you you have this class that you allow your students to submit the problems in paper and pencil or and link. Yeah, and yeah. he wanted uh, what are the proportion of the students that choose link instead of paper pencil and paper? Oh, single digit percentage. I have I my class has got three hundred people in like, this year. I know it's, it's, it wasn't supposed to have that many. We had some problems. The government had some problems. <laughs> I don't know if you know the story. I, yeah, so the story was exams. Were, there's a big exam that people take when they're 18 years old. And because of the virus, because of COVID, these exams were canceled in my country. And uh, so the government had to guess the results. <laughs> so, so the first thing they did was they asked the teachers. They asked the teachers to guess the results for the students. And the teachers always guess very high, right? Because it's important for the, if the, if the schools get very good grades, then it makes the schools look good. So the teachers guess very, very high grades. And then the government looked at these grades and thought, this is bad, we need to lower the grades. So they, they, <laughs> they used some AI to lower the grades. And this AI lowered the grades and then the results came out and there was chaos because there were students saying, oh I got A's all the time, A, 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 every, every, everything I submitted, I got an A. And now the algorithm says I got a C. What the hell is going on here? I was supposed to be going to Imperial, <laughs> but I don't have the grades. So there was real problems and there was a week of chaos with like students on the streets and complaining. And so then the government backtracked. They, they, they stopped and they said, okay, let's just go with what the teachers said. So then all of a sudden, everybody had really good grades. <laughs> everybody had very bad grades. And now all of a sudden, everyone had very good grades. So many, many students made the grades for my university. And now suddenly we have many too many people. So we have 300 people in my class. And uh, of those 300 people, I give talks I give talks on a Thursday evening and I get 10, 15 people coming. So it's a very small number, but that's all I need right now because that's all I need because 10, 15 very keen people can do a lot of work. Right? As long as I keep getting 10 people a year, that's fine. And every year it grows, right? First year I had two people. So every year more and more people come. 
sometimes people hear about it before. They hear that Buzzard is doing this crazy stuff. And uh, they come onto my Discord server and learn a little bit about it before. So yeah, it's growing slowly, but I don't care. It's been complicated with lockdown. I like to go, you know, if I go to, you know, it maybe it would be more than 10 people if I was standing at the front and telling jokes and showing people this software. But this year I have 10, that's okay. 10 to 15. Hey, yeah, uh, I, I, would, I could share some of the experience here with the uh, discrete math course that I'm teaching and uh, uh, and, and also to have some, some students that uh, are motivated to go deeper, right? And, and then last year I, I had this adventure to, to teach type theory and then have a, a, a class with five students. So it's similar experience, right? You have two people yeah. that got more interest in, and then from there you, you keep going and keep learning with them. So yeah. So I'm teaching a so graduate most... course next term. That's the big, I'm teaching a graduate course next term for PhD students. And it's a multi-center thing, it's all online. So there'll be Oxford yeah. and Imperial and Warwick and Bristol and Bath. And I have no idea how many people will come. But uh, these are people that are choosing to learn something about Lean, so. That would be nice. So then last question here is, I think it's from Julio. I don't know if he, he, he wants to make the question by himself or if I should do, but. Uh, his question here is, uh, he's basically asking about the, the why this lack of amazing and also intriguing uh, clear can we leave a legacy? My question is, this lack of commercial interest is only because of budget issues or math is seen as boring when compared to computers and apps? The, the, the lack of interest amongst the mathematicians <laughs> <laughs> is because they're the same as Brian Birch, right? That's the, <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Oh, the lack of commercial interest. Well, mathematics yeah. is useless, right? We all know that, right? Pure, <laughs> pure mathematics, advanced algebraic geometry, what will that teach anyone, right? Uh, is, I don't know, is there lack of commercial interest? Leo is, you know, Microsoft. I don't Microsoft think so, interested. yeah. Google is interested. I don't think so. Exactly. There's, there's people at Google Amazon. working on this kind of stuff. Yeah, there's people at Amazon working on this stuff. So and uh, I can see that IBM too, so for sure. So, oh yeah, yeah I guess. Overall. I don't know what's happening at IBM, but I, I guess you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I don't I don't know why Google is. Uh, I I don't know why. I think that mathematics might be a, a good target for AI, right? Board games. Board games were a very good target for AI. You know, for, for a, you know, you have dirty, you have dirty stuff like facial recognition and self-driving cars. And then, you know, you have to get things working and, you know, this, this is kind of dirty, but pure mathematics is very, very clean. It's like you're, you're either right or you're wrong. Okay, and board games are clean as well. In chess, you win or you lose, right? And, you know, IBM, IBM beat chess. But then everyone was like, well, they can't play Go, right? But then, you know, DeepMind beat Go, right? And now I think board games are done. Right? If, we could, if computers can beat humans at Go, then really that's the end. For AI and board games, the answer is AI can, AI can win. So now we have to move, you know, but, so it's another example of a very clean, a very clean, well-defined area. And the question is, can AI make progress? So I think that's why, that's why they like it. But um. It's still only small. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know so much about the AI side. I just want to change mathematicians. <laughs> I want to change mathematicians. Okay, so I think the last question is, João asked about the, I think he's asking about the prob probability, right? Couldn't it comes to probability, probably oh. theory, I think. <laughs> 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 It turns out that conditional probability is very subtle. We, uh, yeah, we, somebody, somebody tried, and some, a group of people tried to do some very simple thing and they got stuck because, uh, because they wanted to introduce a new random variable. We need, we're missing a tactic. This is pro probability. We have no probability. This is, this is the answer. And uh, 
the reason I know this is because we tried quite an ambitious formalization project in combinatorics. And the, uh, one of the arguments was one of these probabilistic combinatorial things. You, you argue that something must happen because if you look at a very, very large, you know, if you, if you, if you look at all the possibilities, then the, you know, the, the, the chances that it doesn't happen is less than one. You know, the, the chances that it, you know, it, it might fail, but it doesn't always fail. And therefore it must succeed somewhere. You know, one of these kind of arguments. And they tried to formalize this in lean and they got stuck. So the answer is nothing, nothing. But that's not because it can't be done. It's because one group of people got stuck and we learned from that. We thought very hard about what the problem was and we realized that we need another tactic. There's a missing tactic. So th this, was this was only about six months ago. Uh, th there's a missing tactic, but nobody wrote it yet because we don't have enough people. We need more people. <laughs> so good, it, good a, ideas of projects. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a great question, but it's just a but something that looks very very simple. Just the idea of conditional probability, when you actually try to write that down formally from the axioms of mathematics, uh, conditional probability is a is a slightly subtle thing. We were surprised. Well, the answer to this talk is that it definitely got recorded, but. Uh, <laughs> But I don't know if so, it ends up on YouTube. <laughs> I have a very, uh, I'm not sure if, if it's a quick question. So it's regarding the computational performance of the, of the language. I, I, I can imagine simple theorems in simple objects can be very quick to prove. But uh, when you have complex theorems or complex objects, things can, bear, can be very computationally uh, uh, demanding. So uh, is it an issue uh, you, you have encountered no. or not really? No, this is, this is very surprising. We made, we made a complex object and we never ran into problems. And this might just be because Demura is a genius. I can't even, you can say his last name, Demura, Demara, I don't know. Demura. Demura, there you go. <laughs> just the perfect place to ask in Brazil. Demura, yeah, is this right? Yes, Mora, exactly. So maybe he's a genius. I mean, he is a genius, but we just learned that if you build things up piece by piece, very, very slowly, then the system compiles fine. We didn't, we didn't run into problems. I mean, we, we did run into one problem. Things were beginning to, to get slow. And then we asked the computer scientists on the lean chat and they were like, well, take a look at what you're doing here. If we start unfolding everything, you can see that this object you've created is just thousands of lines long. You know, it's a vastly complicated object and you need to, you know, you need to rewrite things. You need to package it up in a slightly different way. We had, an, we had a bad definition, but the computer scientists spotted the problem immediately because we've learned to communicate with them, right? Our, our system was running slowly, but then we found a more abstract way of expressing things just in terms of type theory. You know, here's, here's, here's a random term of a type and we're trying to make it, but it's taking a long time. And then they debugged, they debugged the problem for us because we turned it from a difficult mathematics question into a difficult question about type theory. And then the type theory experts told us what we should be doing. And then we translated that back into a mathematical question. You see, it's kind of, it's amazing. There's a, there's a lot of synergy happening here. I'm communicating with people who have almost disjoint skills from me. You know, they don't know much mathematics at all but they know exactly how to compute in a type theory. And, and th this is why one, one of the things I find so exciting is because you know, I, I'm seeing mathematicians and computer scientists collaborating and they have completely disjoint skills. And you, I'm sure you see this in many other areas, but uh, you know, in, in applied mathematics, you might have somebody that's great at writing the C code and somebody else that's, you know, that, knows, that knows what should be written. But uh, in pure mathematics, this is very rare. People tend to work with other people who are working in exactly the same area. So this is another thing that's changing. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sad about the probability. Thank you for that question. You know, I paint such a positive picture, but we have to remember, <laughs> you know, I'm sticking with pure mathematics right now, but we have to, you know, we have to grow. We will have to start working with 
probability. I, my university takes probability and statistics very seriously. Uh, so I have to get to them somehow. Well, thank okay, you I think, yeah, uh, I have to thank you, Kevin. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's, it's lovely to meet new people and get their questions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's great. Thank you very much. Kevin, I have one last thing okay. to say. Uh, oh, go, go, go. You said, you said that uh, you want to make people excited and interested about it. So I'm going to read one of the comments by a student, Bruno Maiden. <laughs> he said, it's a very interesting seminar. Sometimes I was just asking myself, why am I learning lean? Well, <laughs> to clarify that, definitely motivated to keep, to keep on learning. Great. <laughs> there, there's the chat. Anyone who gets stuck, there's the link. Real, yeah. It's a, this, is a, this is a research level. This isn't just some goofy thing. This, this, is a, yeah. this is research level. Research is happening there. It's a very, Actually, very serious the, 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 This last week I had this experiment. I, I, I asked my students to make a question there. And one of my students make a question. And in one minute, people will reply to him with uh, ideas of the proofs and suggestions of different kinds of possible proofs. And I, 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 I think I make the case that uh, actually, yes, the Zulu chat is a place to, to <laughs> not be afraid a, to make questions. It's an amazing place. It's, it's this is a this is research. Research is happening. You know, it's, yes. there's there's been no mention of the U.S. election, for example. This didn't even come up. It's all <laughs> all every everything there is very much focused on lean and serious problems in lean and, you know, and progress. If you want to if you want to talk about goofy stuff, you can come to my Discord server. But uh, yeah, real names are preferred, and uh, and yeah, serious yes. questions are welcome. Okay. Thank, thank you. Well, thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Jackson. I will make the video available on YouTube. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thank you very Bye, much. Bye, everyone. I shall go thank and eat you. some dinner. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's eight thirty. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry for this. Later. No, it's absolutely fine. I'm very, I'm very pleased for the opportunity. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Kevin. Bye.